Good afternoon from Abu Dhabi. Um, welcome to the panel of case studies number one, entitled Digital Storytelling and the Sharing of Knowledge in the Digital Age. My name is David Risley. I'm a faculty member at NYU Abu Dhabi, where I teach digital humanities. And my thanks go out to uh, all the organizers of this um, really great event. I'm looking forward to hearing from our various speakers today. On the minds of our audience are probably two notions that are in the title of our, of our session today. That is digital storytelling and knowledge sharing. You're probably wondering what, what exactly those terms mean. I hope that in the course of our presentations today, our short presentations, we have seven of them, that we're going to get to that and we're going to be thinking about how new kinds of museum practices are emerging that engage with the digital. Now, I think that we have to see this against the backdrop of the rapid transformations in the way that people use media nowadays, as well as the people um, are engaging in different forms of creative practice. And so I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to have uh, seven presentations, uh, 10 minutes each, um, uninterrupted. If uh, the audience who's watching us today, if you have questions, you're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A at any point. Um, I will be watching them and moderating those. And after our seven presentations, we'll have a panel discussion, um, and then we'll get to the questions from the audience. So our first speaker today is Peter Gorbels, who is manager of digital productions at the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, um, uh, including the museum's website, uh, web presence, the Rijks studio and the app. I'm gonna keep all of our introductions short like that. If you'd like to know more about our speakers, you can find their full bios in the dedicated conference site. Peter, please. need to unmute yourself, Peter, yeah. Peter, uh, we can't hear yes. you, you need to unmute. Perfect. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm Peter Goggles from the Wijks Museum in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and we are the Museum uh, of Dutch Art and uh, History. So I'm gonna tell uh, you a little bit about how we engage our audience with our collection and with uh, storytelling. Uh, and we just launched your new website, so I get a, a little, uh, I'll tell a little bit uh, about that too. So, well, my presentation is a little bit stuck, I think. Okay. Um, well, it's my first slide. Well, a lot of people, we went in the lockdown this year um, and digital became very important for all of us. And um, so we are always open online and we, we made a new virtual tour in two weeks in March when we had to go in the first lockdown. And um, I'll show you a little video about this. If you've ever seen an angry swan, you'll know that this painting isn't exaggerated. She's life-size and fearsome, partly because our view of her is from below. Wings heaved wide, feathers flying. So this became very popular. So we think an online visit is just as important as an offline visit. So uh, that's really our belief. But in the end, we always want to uh, convert people to come to the museum uh, in the long term. So uh, we do both things. We do online and offline. And we have like a, um, well, a conversion funnel 
to well seduce people to come to the museum well if they have the opportunity so we have a little model we have the collection with like studio um, we have the connection we do it with stories a lot on social media we didn't do that on our website but in a new website we do and we have a conversion so this is a little bit our business wheel as we call it with this uh yeah this goes around so um we want to engage people with the collection, connect with stories and convert people to buy things and to come to our museum. And this must work together, we think. So we have Wake Studio, Stories and Museum Visit. And the first thing is Wake Studio, it already exists for eight years. We bring the collection to the audience. We have 500 artworks in very high resolution. You can uh, zoom in, you can save them, you can share them, you can make your own things with it. And it's totally free for private use and commercial use. You don't have to pay us anything for it. So we have now 560,000 Wax Studios, personal accounts, 250,000 personal collections, and more than 2,500,000 uh, 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 downloads. So people really download our high West works. So, well, when, when we, uh, make new digital products, we always look at what is going on, what are the user trends in the digital world. And we looked for Rec like, Studio to pin to us as a great model that worked. So we, we, we copied that a little bit. So Rec like, Studio looks a little bit uh, the same. We engage um, new audience at different levels. We have a user generated visual timeline. You see all the great uh, collections people make with beautiful details. And you can make beautiful details with our artworks as you see here. And we think everybody is a museum director. You can make your own Halloween uh, collection or uh, bottom left character uh, collection as someone who made pictures the bottom left of artworks and made them like, well, up sadistic uh, collection. Um, because we attract new users. So if you love cats, then you can make your own cat collection. So we will, uh, well, aim at a broad audience. We stimulate with active reuse of our artworks. So, for example, we make um, with Albert Heijn's a big uh, supermarket chain in the Netherlands. We put artworks on uh, milk cartons. Uh, this is tableware inspired by our 70 arts golden age uh, artwork. And this is just what people do. They download our artworks and put it on kitchen curtains, for example. So we also have a Rijk Studio Award where we celebrate uh, our, um, our uh, well, collection and the, the, the remixing of it. And here's a little video about that. So well, th that was the winner of this year. It was in, uh, in a book with for visual impaired people. So it was really great. And you see the other two winners. So we think the success factors of Rex Studio, the power of the image, the, the democratizing of art. We think the value of marketing is, is more important than the value of images because we well, you can download them for free, and the platform is more important than the content. So. We, we uh, aimed at a new target group, the culture snacker, we call it, and where we really changed the, the, the tra traditional museum wall with this new platform. So we have these three wheels again. And we also want to do something with collection on our website, connection. So when making a connection, we thought there's an opportunity to create a new online concept. So connecting is part of the Wright Museum mission. We connect visitors, visitors to the Wright Museum online but we connect with the audience through stories. Stories connect with the collection and deepen the collection. So the new concept we came up was connected to the Rijks Museum, very simple. So and we thought, well, Pinterest was the inspiration for Rijks Studio and what is the best example of storytelling in 2020? 
And well, what do you think? Well, it's Netflix, obviously. We are really inspired by Netflix. You can uh, consume series there. So we thought you can think of Rijk stories, the Rijks Museum stories as series of the Rijks Museum. As series have those known correct characteristics, such as episodes, cliffhangers, storylines on different levels, um, fixed duration. It, they are addictive. They are binge, binge watching is a thing. And not only limited to video, you can make other kinds of series. So this is our new website. You see the homepage. This is the stories part. And we all have all kinds of new series you can enjoy on a new platform, video streaming, online events, interactive formats like this one. Um, these are interactive video tools, for example. So it's a new stories platform that actually connects the public with the public with the museum and the collection. Stories are told in the form of high quality series, a proven concept of offering stories to a modern wide audience made famous by Netflix. So we position ourselves as a digital prediction house for art, art and history. Uh, all kinds of formats we use and well, every week we have new episodes of our series uh, for all kinds of audiences. So a little video to end up my presentation and to give you a little impression of our new website and a new stories platform. I mean, that is why we love Vermeer. Invention is the realm of the artist. Photography's magic is awaiting you. So well, that was my little presentation about um, how we engage our audiences with our collection and with stories. And um, yeah, that was it. I thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was great. Thank you. Our second uh, speaker today is Hilary Knight, who is director of digital at uh, Tate um, in London. And uh, she is charged with the Tate's presence online, digital expression in the galleries, including immersive projects, um, in particular, the Modigliani VR experience that I think she's going to begin with today. Please, Hilary. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Um, now, I have some slightly disappointing news, but not too disappointing, I hope. Um, originally, my talk was scheduled to be a case study of our Modigliani VR project. Uh, now, this was a project we delivered in 2017 and 2018 at Tate Modern. Uh, and it's a project that um, recreated Modigliani's final studio in VR form at stations set within a room within an exhibition. Um, and as such, it's a project that we wouldn't be able to deliver today. Um, for very obvious reasons. It involved people share, using shared VR headsets that went directly onto their faces. It involved groups of strangers sitting together in a small room in an enclosed space for a period of time. And doing that at scale, we had a large, we had thousands of visitors to that exhibition. And so much has changed since we delivered that project. And uh, it almost goes without saying that COVID has disrupted everybody's plans and brought some big challenges this year. So rather than talk about an exhibition, the learnings from an exhibition that actually wouldn't apply now in the same way, um, I'm going to talk about the challenges we've faced this year instead in the last, well, in the period since March this year. Um, and in thinking that, uh, this session, I thought about this session and what it asks of us. So it asks how museums have embraced the digital space which got me thinking about how digital sits within museums themselves. Um, now, there are many wonderful examples of digital innovation in museums and galleries, and there are lots of those on this panel, and I'm, I'm thoroughly inspired by all of my fellow panelists. 
But I also wonder how much has digital really become part of the whole museum's practice? Um, in many places, digital, sometimes used in air quotes, is a team or a department who make things that support the main event, the main event being the exhibition or collection displays or the, a visit to the building. But digital is more than just a technology. It's about ways of working. It's about business practices, business models, audiences, storytelling, experiences, and more, much more. So as, as Jane Finnis of Culture24 puts it, digital is about our processes as much as systems and about people as much as hardware. Now, the current pandemic has brought this to the fore um, and quite urgently, because for around half of this year so far, our museums have not been in buildings at all. Our website and our social channels, however, are Tate spaces that didn't close. They have not shut down once this year. Which sort of begs the question, what is Tate if it isn't our buildings? Now, I would argue, and, and Peter has just made this case excellently for the Rice Museum as well, that it is our collection and it is the stories that we tell and the expertise and the knowledge that we hold about art and art history and art practice. And our forced closures have really highlighted for me that as well as being an art museum, Tate is a producer and a distributor of content. And this content ranges from exhibition films to long read articles, to research papers, learning resources, games, activities, books, media partnerships, and more. And if you wanted to be radical, and I sometimes do, you might make the case that our exhibitions and our collection displays are also content, content presented in physical form, and that our buildings are the platforms that hold them. It's just a different way of thinking about what we do. The challenge is how we integrate all of these activities into our core business. So what are the systems, processes, and structures we need to do that? because digital is no longer something that can run in parallel to the core business of exhibitions and collection displays. It's not the innovation add-on. It is part of the core business now, and that cannot be ignored. And by the way, this doesn't undervalue the real life visit. That is still special and vital. Um, I think about it like music. Um, you stream it, you download it, you watch the video on YouTube, you follow the artist on social media, you might even buy the t-shirt, but you will still buy tickets to the live gig to see the real thing in person. These are all good and valid ways of consuming culture. Um, my point is that Tate and all museums can be enjoyed in very many different ways that are just as valid and valuable to audiences wherever they are in the world. Good content is designed for the space it occupies, whether that space is a building or a website, and there will always be audiences for great content. So thinking back to March, and then again more recently, when lockdown happened at Tate, we reconfigured key parts of our website to focus on our collection. Um, and as it happens, we are still locked down. So you can see all of this right now at www.tate.org.uk. Um, we make a lot of films anyway, but we started making those films under social distancing conditions, which adapted and innovated our production methods. Um, we highlighted content that supported home learning. Um, we trialed online talks and we live streamed workshops. We broadcast a concert and we play throughout all of this. We've paid very close attention to our audiences. We watch the audience data from our website and our social channels. We read sector-wide studies and we commissioned research of our own. So we know that audiences are still out there for cultural content. Our online visitor figures are up year on year. People watched more films and for longer. They spent longer with our online content than they ever had before. And they're hungry for content that entertains and engages children. So as a, a highlight, our traffic to our children's section, Take Kids, has increased by 1000% this year. We've also watched digital behaviors change very quickly. And people, what people wanted at the start of lockdown is not what they wanted in the middle of lockdown or as lockdown eases. And it's also not what they want in a second lockdown. It keeps moving. Now in digital, the department, so again, the air quotes, 
we were able to improvise and adapt quickly because we already had robust processes that expect things to change. We use agile methodologies that assume that change will happen and they give a framework for responding to that. But we're not perfect. And lockdown has also shown us where lots more work is needed. We use agile processes in digital, but we're not set up to be agile across the organization. Working laterally or in a matrixed way across different departments is hard. We've begun aligning practices in some areas, but it's really challenging. It requires a shift in working practices and processes, in how we think about audiences and our work, and it also asks us to find common languages for all of these things, and that takes time. Um, so in reflection uh, and looking ahead, this pandemic is a terrible, tragic thing affecting millions of people across the globe. I can't overstate that. We mustn't overstate that. But it has also given us some glimpses of the future. There's hope for a vaccine. But when normal, again, some air quotes, when normal resumes, things won't go back to the way they were. How we work and travel, where we want to live, how we relate to our communities, how we think about ourselves on a global scale, how we think about ourselves as citizens of a planet, how we think about the environment and how we engage with culture has all changed. Even with a vaccine, it's expected to take years for businesses and economies to recover. So as museums, we must adapt and build our capabilities, skills and ways of working to become more fluid and responsive because the only certainty we have is that things will continue to change. And there are opportunities here if we know how to see them and take them. So what are the experiences that digital distinctly offers? What do we already offer in person which might achieve greater scale online or digitally? And which audiences might we reach only online who might never come through our doors but engage with us in another way, in another space? And of course, above all, what are the commercial and business models that support a more blended model of the museum? A museum that is both digital and in physical spaces in a more expanded and distributed way. I don't have the answers to this, but they're big burning questions in my mind. And now answering them will take commitment, investment, and new ways of working for cultural institutions and institutions all over in many, many sectors. But digital culture is already woven into the everyday lives of our audiences. So in doing this well, institutions will become part of that wider social ecosystem. They will also become more adaptable, resilient, and able to evolve and thrive, whatever comes next. Those are my thoughts, instead of Medigliani VR this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Hillary. That was very, very interesting. Thank you very much. So our third speaker today um, is Olivier Moko, who is president of Game in Society and has produced a, an app for the uh, Centre Pompidou in Paris called Prism 7, I guess, Prism 7. Um, so please, Olivier. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, here is a presentation of Prisma 7, Prisma 7 en français, uh, which is a, a video game produced by the Centre Pompidou. Um, and it's a kind of new thing for them. And I'm going to explain the, I would like to, to sustain the fact that games are not just fun and just stupid entertainment, but should be very interesting for the world of art and museum and culture. Um, on April 24th, they, the Centre Pompidou launched its first video game, Prism 7. Uh, it was a national launch at a big exposition in many media, TV, newspapers, etc. Um, and this game is, as you're going to see, a game dealing with art, of course, and um, different approaches to art, how we can see the things differently through the prism of art.
So, uh, it's a video game, and we are really happy to say that's a, a real video game. Uh, as you see, it is available on many devices, from computers, Mac, smartphones, iOS, Android, but also on platform, and I would like to, to strengthen the fact that it is on Steam, which is one of the most biggest video game platforms in the world. So you, we wanted, through this act, to go and reach the gamers' audience, the young audience, the young public, people that are not used to come to our museums. So it's seven levels long. It, you can play it for one hour and a half, two hours. So it's like an exhibition when you go on a visit. Uh, it's totally free. And actually, more than 30,000 people played it on different devices. And they received very well the game with a rating at 4.3 on five on the different devices. So um, what I would like to, to talk about is how we made this and the process behind, behind the scenes, let's say. <clears throat> First, we started with pedagogy. I think this, this is very, very important to say that it's a game whose purpose is to uh, learn uh, different approaches of modern art. It's not just an explanation of one painting, but it's more than an explanation of many uh, artist views and artist technique and how they coin things like color, like light, and how they use it in their uh, artistic uh, um, dimension approach. So they made seven, we created seven um, adaptations, uh, seven ways to uh, develop the, uh, this um, with color systemic, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go through seven levels and each level will be um, an, a focus, a specific focus on the uh, demo, um, artistic approach. Um, here is something I would like really to, to strengthen also is that gameplay is a medium. Uh, let's say that if we control one uh, kind of uh, avatar of these particles, uh, but more than that, we, we've got to make an experience and each level is designed to convey a message. And this message is quite clear and explicit, we hope. For example, in the first level, which is a color, uh, functional color, the main hypothesis here is that color can be functional, like in the Centre Pompidou, you've got the red for communication, the green, uh, for air, et cetera, et cetera. And every color has a specific uh, dimension. For example, when you think about Verini, they put some red stuff in the landscape in order to structure all this, et cetera. So we made this Hall of Fame of seven, six, seven um, different artists, but we are very, really interested in that. And then we convey it into a gameplay experience. So here you've got to interact with different stuff, different colors in order to develop uh, and to solve the, the problem, the puzzle. For example, we had this um, approach dealing with color as emotion and about uh, remembering stuff. So we create this kind of gameplay based on coloring the whole uh, level in order to discover different places and to, to join the end. We've got this game as uh, light as physical stuff. And then you play with projecting uh, your uh, shadow and you can physically work onto the shadow. So we really wanted to, 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 to not to give just a free experience or something, but to tell how games could add something more in the digital experience. That's why every level is an interpretation of the main theme. You can see that we make some, a lot of research and we try to, to, to coin the main approach, systemic approach, uh, physical light approach, et cetera, et cetera. And then that's why it's not, you don't play into the painting, but you play into a digital interpretation of many paintings, which is also a kind of artistic demo, let's say, but we wanted to, 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 to show how it could be, it could be done. So that's why you got the seven levels. For example, here, color animation, um, we want to say that everything is here to convey emotion and how you work, for example, the Kaninsky uh, works on the theory of color. We try to put it into the game and to think, okay, you can be in a different mood with different colors, etc. 
So also as a game is pedagog pedagogical, it's fully integrated in the EduTech uh, platform. We've got a French SEO platform where you get a lot of resources. And uh, it was at the beginning thought and designed as a, as a tool for educators. So um, you can play the seven levels, but you can also um, develop some theories, some teams, some um, things about system color, some on um, political color, etc. And it's kind of a way to create the willing to know more. Um, as say, for example, here are games, it's here a pretext to say, okay, I play, it was cool, it was fun, maybe I want to know more about, that, about this. And so we've got all these resources online and in-game. It's important to say that you've got a, a gallery of 40 uh, paintings inside the game. This is not just only one game. Also, um, about the, the communication strategy and the, the, the fact was that uh, Centre Pompidou wanted to go to the Gamer uh, Alliance. And it was very interesting because it was the first time the art world would consider game world, uh, not the first time because you got great exhibition like EA, like strong gaming, but here it's at the museum, very national museum, going to the gamer's world. And so we made a communication with the game industry and media, uh, game media industry, and we had this special event at the Paris Games Week, which is the one with the four biggest um, gamers uh, assembly in, in Europe. And so we had this stand, we go through uh, to meet the, the gamers and play it. And it was very, very interesting for everybody because for some people, it was a way to discover new audiences. And for these audiences, it was a way to go into uh, this. And it was interesting also because there is all gamers or daddy gamers or mommy gamers that were young gamers 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and today that they still play, but they do want to play new stuff. So that's a way to offer them this possibility. So next, uh, next week we're releasing it to China. Uh, it's very, very exciting because um, we, we made the whole translation and we are going to read it on iOS, on Steam, etc. Uh, we also plan a VR adaptation. It's very important to say that because we've got a pipeline that's very dedicated to this as we made it on mobile and real time so we can put it on Oculus Quest, for example. But here also the gameplay is a message. And I really insist on that saying, okay, we can experiment stuff differently and we can have a new kind of pedagogy with game design and with games. Um, we know that in museum, we are used to create some um, uh, workshop for children where they test, they play, they manipulate. So it's quite the same in the game. And that's, I think, very interesting to, to, to have it in mind. So if we want to go in a larger, um, uh, um, discussion of what could be next if you want to, to join the world of gaming and museum and to, to think about new possibilities. First, uh, I would like to say that message is very, very important. And game design here is to produce actors. And even when you play, when you create a game, you think about the people who are going to play it. And so in order to that, you design an interaction. You're not consumers, you are actors or something. And because you're actor of this game, this experiment, you're going to talk about this. So it produces stories. Uh, it was Ubisoft to say that, okay, we're here, a kind of big machine producing little stories, little even anecdotes. And then this is the main idea here is that you produce some experiment and this experience can be told to your friend. Secondly, about the public, um, one thing I do think is very, very important and Fortnite, Roblox and other multiplayer games show that is games are social space places. You can join on MMO, you can join online and it's very important because you play and you spend time in World of Warcraft, in Fortnite, just not playing but hanging around with friends. And I think if you think about this digital visit and the virtualization of that. Please integrate the social dimension of gaming because it's a way for people to go there and to meet. Then also the space approach is very interesting as Hilary pointed, it. it's about space or this digitalized space or real space, online spaces. 
And level design, the art of producing levels or levels in game and evolution through level, is some skill that could be used to design interaction and um, journey, let's say, a digital journey. And I think this, what we wanted to do through Christmas Eve and to create this digital journey, is not a hardcore game, it's for everybody, the UX is for everyone, everyone can play it from 7 to 77. So it's more hanging in a digital space, this, uh, this idea. Also, about the content, you can have mini games, you know, the very snack games, very short to long format. Here it's a long format. One or an half is a very long format for digital experience. So adapt your strategy to your audience, of course, but you need to think about it because you can do a very small repetitive game, like they say, every month you get one and we could think about it, or a larger one. But also we need to, to, to think about the fact that museum can be seen as producer, content producer, media, but also a platform, especially if you go online, let's try to think about a platform approach and how would you monetize it? But I think something it's here to talk about is, okay, we made a free game, but could we do something more uh, and could we monetize it? So thank you very much for all this. And if you want to talk about that, Thanks, Olivier, very much. I actually went and played your game in preparation for the panel today, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to having discussions about that afterward. Thanks very much, Olivier. Okay. Thank you. So our next speaker, a speaker is Jean Kogan, um, who is an artist and programmer from the United States of America, um, interested particularly in autom autonomous systems, uh, neural networks, and generative art. And uh, Jean's presentation has been pre-recorded, and we're going to be showing it now. Okay, hi, my name is Gene Kogan. I'm an artist and a programmer, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my, my work. Uh, so uh, first off, I'll just mention uh, I'm probably best known for my work on ml 4 at github.io. This is a resource of collection of resources on how to apply machine learning for arts and creativity. I've been working on this kind of compiling practical materials for the last few years. And so a lot of the stuff I'm showing you'll find there. Um, I write a lot of instructional guides, trying to get artists and other creatives up to speed with, you know, these cutting edge machine learning techniques. Um, I teach a lot of classes and I record many of them. I put them online. Um, and so you can find those all on, on ML4A and lots of workshops as well, which used to look a lot like this. Now they look a little bit more like this kind of over Zoom. Um, but um, something that I hope we can kind of resume in the future. So I'm an artist. I'm interested in how machine learning, how uh, techniques in AI and computer science can be made to use interesting, expressive visual art, sound art, and so on. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of that. One thing I've been really interested in for the last few years are these techniques which use neural networks to create images um, using optimization-based techniques and things like Deep Dream. So maybe if, uh, if your audience may be familiar with Deep Dream, it's this technique for trying to synthesize images which um, activate certain memories or regions or, 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 uh, or you know, states of neural networks. And so for example here, this is an image which is synthesized in order to um, express two different uh, what two neurons are essentially looking for, patterns that they that they see. And um, there's a bit of a compositional control, which I attach. I'll show you more examples. There's some composition here where I'm able to um, actually uh, devote different sections of the canvas to um, expressing different neurons. And so this is something that I've, I've, um, I go into, into a little deeper into my classes, um, you know, making, making things like this. Um, you can also make, as you can see, videos from this. It's a feedback loop where every output uh, frame becomes the input to the next um, generation. So the, the next frame is made with the previous input, which is maybe distorted somehow or masked or some other kind of, um, you know, some other kind of uh, perturbation to try to make some, some variety in dynamics. And so here, um, some, just some more stills. This is originally taken from a picture of an eye where the eye has been segmented. And then each of the segments are used as masks, which, which um, force this process to express neurons in each of the different regions. 
Um, and then I, I've also figured out a way to kind of make them uh, spiral in infinite loops. So these are actually just three second long videos that you're looking at, each in the left and the right. So I'll prove it to you. You can see that the, that the video bar is just looping around. And um, it looks like it never begins or ends. It just looks like it's infinitely kind of expanding outward. Um, but it's just an illusion. It's actually um, just a three second long video. And it's something made possible with, with this technique of optimization. So here we're trying to optimize for certain things like expressing these neurons, but you can also try to optimize for continuity um, to try to not break any of the animations. And so you can actually um, achieve that. This is an example of the same thing, except I'm using a technique called style transfer instead of deep dream. And style transfer is basically synthesizing textures which resemble some source. And in this case, the source is this image of Hokusai's Great Wave off Kanagawa, um, a famous Japanese um, woodcut painting from the 1800s. And here it's just going in an infinite loop. And so this is actually seven seconds long, and it's just generating endless amounts of this texture, but it never, never goes anywhere. Um, this is the same thing, except the source texture is um, Kandinsky, so Vasily Kandinsky, the, the, Soviet, the Russian artist from the 20th century. And then this is my favorite texture to use, Google Maps. Um, so I enjoy kind of using Google Maps as a texture. This is sort of what I imagine a nightmare looks like, um, you know, kind of zooming in on your phone infinitely, but never really goes anywhere. Um, and then this is the same thing, kind of the composition applied back uh, using things like Deep Dream. And, and things like Deep Dream and, and Style Transfer are always kind of seen uh, very much by artists as these tricks. Um, you know, they, they do most of the work. And, um, and I'm interested in kind of bringing back some of these tools as uh, uh, bringing these back as tools for, a comp uh, for an artist to compose with. And so I'm, I, I, a lot of my, my research in the last few years has centered around this idea of trying to, to, tr trying to bring these things back. Um, and then here's masks being used from different people. So on the left, it's Mona Lisa. And on the right, this is actually Jan McCoon, who's the, um, one of the, the people who, who made neural networks uh, work the way they do today. Um, same idea, to just texture synthesis. Um, so here is kind of imagining a Jackson Pollock that never was. Um, of course, in the style of Jackson Pollock or a Frida Kahlo that never was, you might notice kind of loose eyebrows and eyes and things like that. Um, she drew a lot of self-portraits. Um, and then the style transfer technique that I mentioned um, it, it just a, a few frames ago is, is this is kind of it in its essence, the idea of generating one image uh, regenerating one image in the style of another. So this is the Mona Lisa in the style of, of um, Starry Night, Hokusai, and Google Maps. Um, the style transfer thing is, is really actually a very broad technique. It can be used in a lot of different ways. Here I'm using style transfer in a kind of more clever way where I'm, I'm projecting myself into paintings. Um, just as a set for, for humor, you know, it's kind of a, a fun thing to, to kind of, you know, um, well, take a humorous look at different uh, older paintings, insert myself into various situations where I'm, I'm not needed or not wanted. Um, yes, this is actually what happened. Um, yeah, so mostly making jokes online is part of my job. Um, and then another aspect of, of machine learning that really interests me are generative models. So most people have, uh, who are following this field have probably heard of generative adversarial networks or GANs. Um, or autoencoders or transformers or any of these, you know, wonderful uh, generative models, which is to say neural networks that are able to synthesize new data, uh, data that looks like it came from the data set that your network was trained on. Um, and so you can generate cats or TV screens or cars and things, things of that sort. And it's incredibly interesting to, to scientists, but also to engineers. Um, it's, it's interesting to, you know, because it has many applications generating visual and, and audio content. It has applications towards simulations. So things like, like robots or reinforcement learning agents, as you might hear, um, need some way of imagining the future or playing out sort of future scenarios. And this is kind of, uh, one thing that allows us to do that are these generative models. So they're, they're really interesting to scientists, but also to artists alike. Um, I've been using uh, GAN since since basically they, they since Ian Goodfellow and 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 his collaborators and future um, you know future influences came up with this idea. Um, it's been really really successful in generating interesting visual content. My first project on it was a book from the sky, which you can see here, where I generated handwritten Chinese characters. 
here you can see that the GAN is able to interpolate between generating different characters. And so you can kind of see a, a gradual change between these different, these different, um, these different characters. And so this is a project that I worked on. And GANs have become incredibly realistic. So the, the project in the last slide was from 2015. But since then, um, they're now very high resolution. You can train them on things like paintings. So this is a, a style GAN, which is kind of one of the, the more recent um, generative adversarial networks that have been successful, trained on uh, paintings. So a, a historical data set of around uh, 100,000 paintings. And you can see that it's able to generate portraits and landscapes and, and you know, more abstract works and documents and archives and, and all this kind of stuff. And so it's, it's really, really versatile um, and, and, you know, produces kind of interesting uh, textures. And um, the cool thing about GANs, and I wish we had more time to talk about it, this is something I talk about in my classes often, but the cool thing about them is that they, they give you control over this feature space. So you can do things like blending different kinds of well, um, features together. So here I'm able to blend an owl and a dog into a sort of owl dog. So this is what you get when you mix an, a generative owl and generative dog. And these generative models give you the ability to do that by, by taking these vectors inside of the latent space, as we call it, and adding them together or subtracting them, um, you know, kind of just uh, Combine, recombining them in interesting ways. I make a lot of installations. I'm going to have to hurry up, but I'll, I'll just mention that I've made installations using these techniques. This is a style transfer mirror that I call Cubist Mirror, where you see yourself in the style of, a, of various famous paintings. Um, this is an installation which lets you finger paint what is essentially turned into a, a portrait, uh, or sorry, a, a, a landscape photograph, a realistic looking landscape photograph on the right half of the screen. Um, this is a similar thing that lets you kind of create satellite imagery based on placing different pieces um, on the on the grid. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because I'm, I'm out of time, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I like to build a lot of installations, and um, yeah, I hope um, I hope those of you in this field are, are are interested in kind of having these more on display. They're they're really big curiosities to people. So. Um, so that's all. My website is genecogan.com and ml4a.github.io. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jane, um, virtually. Um, our uh, fifth speaker is going to be today, Anna Lowe, um, who co-founder of Smartify, who will be talking about museums and apps. Anna, please. Hi, thanks, David. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Anna. I am the co-founder of Smartify, which is a global platform for uh, discovering and learning about art. Um, in this case study, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we use Smartify, um, how we use AI and augmented reality uh, to kind of improve visitor experiences and online experiences, um, and also kind of some of the work we've been doing during the pandemic when music museums have kind of had to shut down, reopen, change their visitor experiences, so some of the work we've been doing. Um, so Smartify is a company that is based in London and in Amsterdam. Um, our mission is basically to help people learn about art and to support the resilience of um, art institutions. And we're a social enterprise, so we're registered as a, a community interest company. And so all of our develop development is really to kind of um, support the sector and, um, you know, everything we do kind of goes back into the platform. Um, so I'm going to show a quick video about kind of just to give you a sense of what Smartify does. Um, we launched in, let me just share my screen, one second. Um, if you can see that there. So we launched in 2017, I'm just going to play this short video. So 
I'll just pause it there. So um, as you can probably see from the video, um, Smartify is a mobile and a web app that has been described as the Shazam and the Spotify of art. It allows audiences to basically use their own smartphone to scan and identify an artwork that could be a painting, but it could also be like a 2D, uh, sorry, a 3D object or a, a sculpture or a piece of architecture. Um, identify it, and then it pulls the information from the museum database into your phone. Uh, then the audiences can save their favorites, um, follow audio and media guides, and um, we also work on bespoke um, uh, augmented reality products, and I'll show you one of those in a bit. Um, so the platform is used by um, over 200 museums of all sizes. And I suppose the kind of main benefit there is that, you know, obviously it means that for the user, they don't have to kind of download a different app every time they go to a different museum. And it also means that particularly for smaller museums. So we work with a range of museums um, from you know, large museums like the Belvedere or the National Gallery that you saw in that, um, that clip there. But we also work with a lot of smaller museums who, if it wasn't for something like Smartify, they would never actually have a kind of a platform to put their content um, online, to put kind of um, audio guides um, into the hands of their visitors. And so particularly with COVID-19, a lot of those smaller museums have really um, relied on us in terms of changing the visitor experience. Um, so a little bit, I guess, about um, you know, Smartify by the numbers you can see there, um, we have kind of over 2 million works in the database um, and yeah, you know, about 3 million downloads at the moment. Um, our goal really is to bring some of the digital business models, I suppose that, um, you know, that Peter and also kind of Hillary mentioned in terms of inspiration from Netflix and Spotify into uh, the museum and heritage sector. So really thinking about how you can have that um, connected experience where you uh, might scan an artwork in the physical gallery, but then save it, look back at it later on, and um, you know, think later on about kind of how you're engaging with, with the collection and have a video experience uh, later, later on. Um, so in terms of those kind of COVID-19 impacts, we've seen, um, you know, the kind of real damage that's been done to the sector over the past um, six to eight months. Um, I think it's fair to say that museums don't really have digital business models. The business model of museums has been up until this point, um, you know, ticket sales. It's been um, the cafe you know, exhibitions. You know, as Hillary said, they are the main event. They're the main driver. And, um, you know, there's been this very kind of long term underinvestment in digital in institutions, which means that, you know, most museums don't have kind of paid membership um, online membership experiences. They have their you know membership cards, but not an online experience. They don't have advanced e-commerce, most, most museums. Um, and there isn't kind of any marketing before, during or after the visit. And then of course, in terms of physical, there are a lot of changes that have had to happen just in terms of the physical experience. So, you know, removing those um, headsets, audio guides, paper maps, interactives. Um, so in terms of kind of what we've been doing, the first step really for us was to make sure that all of um, our museums could create flexible content. Um, so this is, um, you know, a tour guide from um, the Watts Gallery, which is a very small museum in um, Surrey. And um, they already were using Smartify as an audio guide platform, um, but they wanted to kind of start to use it a little bit more like a podcast. So they were working from home, um, getting their curators to kind of create these tours changing the orders of them and because this can be embedded into the website also as a media player um and in you know and as a web app it was kind of highly shareable content that could kind of be um, put anywhere and so as well as it being their audio guide in the museum it was very easy to then transition into that being just kind of an at-home um tour so if i just play this video here oh I'll just go back for delight the artist took in his surroundings here in surrey as curator of landscape, my work revolves around the research and interpretation of the grounds and buildings here at Watts Gallery Artists Village. This is a unique position within the curatorial team, and it has given me the opportunity to research George Frederick Watts, his wife Mary Watts, and their life in Surrey, and the impact they made on their community and the surrounding landscape. So too, have I learned something about the effect of the landscape on them as artists and as a couple. 
So this um, audio guide was literally just produced at home um, by the curator, just using her own mobile phone. Um, and then kind of just using our drag and drop tools was just able to kind of put that into the platform and then publish it across uh, their website and other places. Um, they found kind of really huge engagement with this kind of, you know, um, I think there were about 5,000 hits on this tour alone just in one month, which was far beyond anything they've ever kind of reached before at the Watts Gallery. Um, so they were kind of, you know, keeping updating those kind of tours and making sure that as they reopened, if they had to go back into lockdown again, that they could then kind of have that flexible content. Another thing that we've done with the National Gallery is integrate an e-shop. Um, they saw that a lot of people were scanning things using Smartify to kind of have that contactless um, visit, you know, using their mobile phone to get information in the galleries. And they embedded um, the e-shop so that when you scan Whistle Jacket, you can see that very clearly the, the shop items that you can purchase um, that kind of go with that artwork so that people, when they're most engaged, they can then follow through. Um, so we've just implemented that for them and that's an online shop at the moment, but they're working on a click and collect option as well so that people can actually go, just go down and pick it up on their way out without having to go into the shop and kind of touch everything. Um, and I did mention augmented reality. Again, this is something where we've had a lot of museums who want to kind of have these flexible uh, blended experiences where you have these, it's available on site for the visitor that wants to go on site, but it's also available, um, you know, online, just kind of either via the website or via Smartify web app or um, native app. So this was the Ray Harryhausen exhibition at the National Galleries of Scotland. Ray Harryhausen is of course, you know, a very famous um, stop motion animator, um, you know, responsible for works like Clash of the Titans and just amazing movies like that. Um, they have an incredible exhibition. There was so much archive material that couldn't actually fit into the exhibition. So that was kind of the first thing that they wanted to use the app for to have, you know, all that extra content available. Um, but they also wanted to have, you know, to bring it a little bit more alive. And so we created um, this kind of augmented reality uh, skeleton so that, you know, when you're scanning the kind of original John Landis models, you can actually then kind of bring them to life whether you're in your living room at home or whether you're actually in the exhibition, um, there's a kind of extra content, extra things to do um, while you're engaging with the exhibition. Um, I suppose the key thing about all of this is that, um, you know, as people are engaging, it's kind of what, um, going back to what Peter said earlier, um, about kind of making sure that you're connecting email addresses, that you're passing those email addresses on back to the institution. So with Smartify, um, people can um, use it as a guest completely anonymous, anonymously, but they can also create an account. Um, and then we pass those emails on, people sign up so that we can pass those back on uh, to the museum. So that kind of reconnects everything at the end so that museums can then target marketing and kind of get those people into the door as well. Um, and we also kind of send push notifications in the app if you're nearby a museum that's you know on the platform and kind of things like that when there are new exhibitions opening as well. Um, the final thing to say, I suppose, is, you know, just in terms of the kind of the, the abilities of a digital platform um, in both in, on, in the museum and, and outside of the museum at home, um, it does open up a lot more kind of radical potential for access, um, which is something that, you know, a few other people have mentioned on, on this panel, um, both in terms of languages and having um, you know, multi-language, of course, every time you're scanning a digital wall label, you can have it in as many languages as you need. Um, but also in terms of transcriptions and most people who have accessibility requirements like low vision, they are actually using their own mobile phone often to kind of have larger font sizes or have Siri read text out loud to them. And so having those digital tools available will always make things, you know, m much more accessible um, than kind of the traditional, you know, rented audio guides uh, might be. Um, and for us, you know, as Smartify, the next step for us is really taking those tools that we've created with museums to kind of create their own audio tours and videos and start opening it up also beyond um, the museums. Um, there are many people, many experts who kind of want to have um, commentary on music, have commentary on artworks and kind of want to bounce off and have these kind of social spaces, uh, kind of platforms for discussion and, and use the collection as that point of inspiration. And so the next step for us is really um, bringing in more dialogue from different experts in the field. And I think in a digital wall label, again, that's a place where, um, you know, you don't just have to have that one interpretation. You can have multiple interpretations. You can have multiple voices. And I think that's also, you know, the radical potential of um, a, a digital space to kind of actually start to invite people outside of the museum to have their own commentary on these works. Um, 
I guess, you know, finally, just a few points that I was thinking about when I was just thinking of this of this um, panel and questions we might want to bounce off as, as well. You know, is the future museum primarily a tourist destination or is it actually now part of a kind of national and, you know, international infrastructure of education? And obviously those aren't exclusive roles, but they do require quite different fun funding and a vastly different allocation of you know, where we spend resources in museums. So you know, going forward, museums may have to kind of change where they are focusing their attention um, in terms of what they actually want to be. Um, and also kind of off the back of that, you know, where will these new growth areas be? Will they be in these kind of Netflix models that, that Peter was talking about? And if so, um, you know, what staffing changes are needed? Where is actually investment needed, even though Obviously, this is you know an extremely difficult time for the sector, but in terms of kind of planning for the future, um, that's something to think about. Where will the new business models be? Um, so that's everything from me. Um, I'll just stop sharing. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, our sixth speaker um, this afternoon in Abu Dhabi um, is going to be Laith Carlson and Laith is the executive director of the Museum of the Future in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. And I think he's going to be speaking to us today. It's a museum, by the way, which is in process, if I understand correctly. I drive past it sometimes. I see it in the, every time I drive past it in Dubai, it seems to change ever, ever, ever so slightly. Please, Laith. Thank you. Uh, I will not be using slides, so I will just use the backdrop. You see the museum actually under construction behind me. Our Crane just came down about a week ago, um, so we're, we're well underway at this point. Uh, but this is only, the, I think, the latest museum that I've worked in in a career now 29 years um, in the museum field. It's all I've ever done. Uh, and I tend to work for museums that I would call not normal museums. Uh, so I've never worked for an art museum, uh, so I'm an outlier maybe on this panel. Uh, I've worked for a museum that centered on a practice and had no collection. I've worked for a museum that was first a website and had a collection that we let everyone use every object in the collection, and I really mean use them. Uh, and now I'm working for a museum of something that hasn't happened yet. That said, the Tech Museum of Innovation in Silicon Valley, Living Computers Museum and Labs in Seattle, Washington, and the Museum of the Future here in Dubai all have something in common. And that is that they, that part of the experience for each of these museums is digital. Um, we talk sometimes about a generation born digital. I work in museums that are born digital. Uh, and I think to you know, Hillary's point earlier, uh, it's always confused me a bit that in museums, we sometimes think of digital as its own department or its own group, whereas in no corporation that I know of would ever think of digital that way. The Museum of the Future is something that you know, some of you, I mean, we, we heard David talking about driving by it. Um, it is on Sheikh Zayed Road here in Dubai, right next to Emirates Towers. It's like some of my former institutions that had an interesting start and it did not start actually as a physical museum the way that you see it now. Uh, back in 2013, in conjunction with something called World Government Summit here in Dubai, there was the idea to try to somehow make the future more uh, real, more tangible to the world leaders that come to that event. And so the first pop-up museum of the future was created and it was created as a completely immersive experience of a possible future. Uh, that continued then every year since. Um, so every year there has been a pop-up museum of the future focused on a different topic area. Um, everything from climate crisis to government services to artificial intelligence um, to where you know human biology is going. So it's been a different theme every year. And this has been so impactful to the attendees that come to this three-day event um, that His Highness Sheikh Mohammed uh, bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President, uh, Prime Minister and Ruler of Dubai made the decision um, to create a permanent museum of the future, uh, to bring that type of immersive experience of possible futures to everyone who comes to Dubai, um, but also to expand that actually to those who may not be able to obviously come here to Dubai. And in the current circumstances, that uh, mission has been a critical part of what we're trying to achieve is to broaden the idea of what the museum is. The physical space is amazing, um, but we also realize that not everyone can come here to Dubai. Uh, the bu building itself, I will say, you know, is, um, as I mentioned, well underway. I'm going to see, let's see if I can do, so you can see a bit of it there. I'm, it's a little cut off, but it's this incredibly daring tourist-shaped 
building. Um, one of the interesting attributes of it is because it's all curves um, inscribed with this Arabic calligraphy, it's very hard to understand the scale of it. So it's about the equivalent of an 18 story building. Um, and no one ever thinks of it as being that large. And when they see it from the outside, it's an interesting optical um, illusion, the museum itself. Uh, but returning to, I think, the core of, of this conversation, which is you know, digital being at the heart of an endeavor. And as I mentioned, in a corporate environment, you would never expect digital to be separate. And I think the greatest articulation of that is uh, Elon Musk's companies. Um, not only does he think of digital when it comes to the product, and I would argue that something like a Tesla is more of a rolling computer than a car, um, just like I would say a Falcon rocket is more of a shooting computer um, than a traditional rocket. Uh, he also applies similar strategies to how he runs his businesses and how he implements those technologies, thinking of the businesses as computers. Uh, so the idea of using you know, robotics for assembly, using 3D printing for uh, rocket engines, um, thinking in more of a componentized way of thinking of things. So things are interchangeable and can um, change and transform and be adapted. And when digital is at the heart, that is the opportunity, is that it's vastly scalable, it's updatable, it's adaptable, it's flexible. The connections between the components end up actually being as important as the components themselves. And I think it's worth considering what might happen if we take that approach and apply it to museums. This is something I've been doing now for about the last decade, um, starting with my work at the Tech Museum of Innovation in Silicon Valley, um, now known actually as the, the Tech Interactive, so they've dropped the word museum from their name since I've left that institution. The, the main project that we worked on there, other than revamping all the exhibitions, which was my role as the uh, head of exhibitions and content, we also implemented something we called the Smart Museum System. Um, and what this was, was a digital backbone that connected all of the exhibitions and visitor experience. Uh, and how it worked was you basically created a profile on the Smart Museum system. It tracked you as you went through the exhibitions and it saved different artifacts from the exhibition. So as you went through an experience, you might have photos taken of you. You may have data from um, our uh, wearable technology exhibit captured. You may you know, participate in a experiment that the results of which would be captured to your profile. The most, I think, critical piece of the experience was a synthetic biology wet lab experience that we did with Stanford University, where visitors would actually conduct a real synthetic biology experiment uh, with real synthesized DNA. But it took um, about 24 hours to incubate um, your bacteria that you had injected with the DNA. So you had to log back on the next day to see the results of your 15 or 20 minutes of effort. And that proved critical. So the use of this um, platform and particularly the mythetech.org um, user interface really drew, that was what really drove a lot of that uh, traffic. Um, but people could then go to that extended experience and see the results of their visit, but also be pushed to other resources, be notified of um, talks, workshops, classes that were coming up, other things in the community that they could connect to to extend the experience. Uh, and that platform is something that the tech is currently using, obviously, in the shutdown environment to um, still connect people to the museum experience and to other uh, resources that are available. Uh, the next project I worked on with Digital at the Core was Living Computers Museum and Labs in Seattle, which was a project of Microsoft co-founder Paul G. Allen. Um, and Paul had realized that a lot of the early computers he had worked on were no longer available for people to use. So he started buying them and restoring them and then making them available through a website called PDP Planet. Uh, that was so successful. People really liked logging on to old PDP 10s and other computers remotely uh, that we decided to build a full time permanent museum dedicated to usable vintage technology and current technology. So we built living computers uh, and it's a museum, I think, with a fairly radical concept that every person coming to the museum, either physically or virtually, was treated as a user. And with everything that being treated as a user implies, they were not visitors, they were not guests, they were absolutely users of the museum, users of the technology, users of the digital assets. Um, and what that meant is that we made everything available. So everything from world's first supercomputer, a, um, 
a uh, CDC 6500 that we painstakingly restored uh, to one of the only operable Apple One computers in the world that every visitor could sit down and type on, um, including Steve Wozniak, um, which was quite a fun experience for me. I also got to introduce him to Paul Allen. Um, the two of them had actually never met until we had an event at our museum, uh, which was quite an interesting thing. I was talking to both of them in the setup and neither mentioned that fact to, to me until uh, they were there at the event. Um, so quite an interesting you know, experiment in making use core. We also had a policy that if anyone asked nicely, we would take them anywhere in the museum, including collection storage. Sometimes they'd walk by my office. Uh, we'd go back and pull a video game from the collection for them to play if they wanted to. So it was a really unique experience in making the user at the core. Uh, and now with my work at um, the Museum of the Future, we're thinking also of digital at the heart of the experience, but more from a storytelling perspective um, and more from that connectivity perspective of how do we connect all of the elements of the Museum of the Future experience to a digital core. And um, what that means, everything from our IoT enabled built smart building, um, which is one of the most complex buildings ever built. Um, we have tens of thousands of sensors embedded in the building. All of them will funnel into our core IT systems. Uh, everything with, about visitor interaction will funnel into that. Everything about staff, including uh, real-time location services and other attributes will funnel into that system. And by having everything treated in one core system and everything treated as a relationship, so the, there's relationships between visitors and staff, there's relationships between sensors um, and AV components, everything is treated that way in our core database. Uh, and those connections are really critical because we can gain interesting insights into the experience and actually change and modify things um, in real time. Uh, so we're quite um, excited about how all that integration happened. It's, it's underway right now. But the point of all of that is to make a unified storytelling experience. So everything from when people interact with us on our social media channels, which will activate shortly, uh, to the, the website, to the visitor app, to the in-person experience, to the um, projects that Dubai Future Foundation, our parent organization, runs outside of the museum in um, Emirates Towers here in Area 2071. All of those things can be connected um, together and have part of one cohesive storyline that really presents this optimistic view of the future and gives people an active role in that. And that's really the end to which we're working to is to inspire people through the museum experience and the digital experience, but really inspire them to act, um, inspire them to take an active role in creating a future that all of us want to live in. And I think right now in the current conditions, I think everyone is desperate for that. Everyone is desperate for the hope, the idea that their actions can have impact, that things will get better, um, that there is a better experience coming out the end of this. And so my challenge um, that I would put forth is that if digital is at the heart, how would you turn your museum into a computer? And if you can, I think you would be more adaptable to the current challenges that we face in, in this crisis. And I'll just close by noting that, you know, Tesla was the first major car manufacturer to restart production after COVID hit. Um, and in SpaceX's case, they made no modifications to their launch schedule. So they continued to operate completely um, on track um, to the point where just about 12, no, 13 hours ago, um, they launched the first mission um, to ISS with astronauts since the space um, shuttle program ended nine years ago. Um, on, on schedule, I think they had a one day delay. Um, and later today, they should be uh, docking with ISS. Uh, and I'll note that this, those space shuttles that they've replaced are now all in museums. Uh, and they're all in museums, which are currently closed as far as I know. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laith. Really interesting conversation I can see ahead of us. Um, thank you. And our uh, seventh and final speaker uh, is Sarah bin Safwan, who's on the curatorial team at the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. Um, this team is interested in, in, our, in sketching out what the curatorial vision for another museum that is in, under construction, so to speak, right? Um, but in the capital city of the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi. Please, Sarah. Thank you so much and uh, really amazing presentation. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to be sharing my presentation. Um, firstly, 
Uh, firstly, I'm going to be introducing the museum and basically showing what we were and basically having a focus on our public programming, um, which have been the most affected by the pandemic and how we have been adapting to that um, and making more of a digital presence. Um, Firstly, uh, Guggenheim Abu Dhabi is, of course, a museum that still does not exist. We have been working uh, in a space, uh, just in offices that are offsite, and um, and we are still working that way until the museum gets built. And so, we were already kind of in this place of um, having our, I guess, doors closed as as most museums across the world have been doing. But um, so, what we have been usually focusing on is pop-up activations through our programming across multiple sites uh, in the UAE, um, using our sister institutions here in Abu Dhabi, like Culture Foundation or Manara Sadiat or Louvre Abu Dhabi, where we've also had previous programming. Um, and just to introduce a little bit about the museum, it, it really is a, a, a focus on contemporary art from the 1960s onwards, um, with a focus on uh, uh, art from West Asia, North Africa, and South Asia. Um, we are looking to, I guess, decentralize the perspective of art history within the collection um, and building on that and not focusing on a geography or nationality, but become a much more inclusive and transnational uh, permanent collection. <clears throat> For our pre pandemic public programming, you know, I'm, and I'm going to be showing images as well and going into some of them. And uh, I, it's kind of weird, like going back to the images and seeing all of these events with like a huge amount of people and, you know, this very, you know, community um, atmosphere. And, and now we're all pretty much working through the screens as we are now. And uh, it's kind of strange to like go back and I'm always wondering when, when are we going to go back? But it's obvious now that throughout all of this, we have to adapt and actually take on the challenges that have been presented to us through this crisis and actually adapt it into the future even after the pandemic is over. And so through our public programming, we focus on a, cent on a central theme and build on that and introduce uh, artists from the collections, work with artist collaborations, um, have huge audiences and, and artist interaction between them, whether through master classes or uh, other such things like that. Um, and also a huge collaboration with local students and artists as well. And so this is, uh, I'm going to be presenting some images from our public programming. And so this is one of them uh, where we collaborated with Rafael Lozana Hemmer on the Corniche of Abu Dhabi, where um, participants can come and hold on to uh, heart rate sensors and then the heart rate sensors would then beam out this light. And so there was definitely, you know, this uh, atmosphere of community and coming together. Um, and this was in conjunction with the first ever um, exhibition by Guggenheim Abu Dhabi Seeing Through Light in 2015. In 2017, we opened our second exhibition at Manada Tsadiyat, uh, which is another one of our, I guess, satellite locations in Abu Dhabi, in Sadiyat Island. And uh, here we're working with Susan Hefuna, an uh, Egyptian and German artist who <clears throat> focus on this notion of mark making, but also uh, pathways and how, uh, and how I guess humans uh, may cross one another without knowing that there is that kind of like invisible, invisible connection. And so the students from NYU Abu Dhabi uh, are all ma majorly uh, perfor were performers or theater dancers and singers. And so we asked them to collaborate with Susan Herfuna and she conducted a three day workshop about her uh, concepts and her techniques and uh, then which then iterated into this final performance, which happened within the gallery space. Um, and then there was this communication with the artworks in the space as well. Um, for another programming with the, the Creative Act exhibition, uh, we were focusing on the idea of the Fluxus movement. And you can see like there's just like a huge party and everyone's having fun. And 
Um, we uh, did a kind of huge festival day where we had multiple things going on. We had a fashion show, we had uh, Japanese Amarati dancers, we had spoken word, uh, and we had a party at the end. And um, uh, in this in particular were uh, students from Zag University that, um, that basically uh, took inspiration from the exhibition that was on view and then uh, interpret that into fashion items that were then performed by their models in front of everyone. <clears throat> and then another program that we were doing where uh, we focused on uh, uh, Basquiat, we recently acquired uh, Cabra from uh, by Jean-Michel Basquiat, which is also, which was on view at the Louvre Abu Dhabi. And so we took it as an opportunity to showcase a, uh, a program that had panel discussions, university engagement, and then finally a kind of, uh, I guess, inspired by the Canal Zone party and then brought it forward into the future. And we had, you know, a playlist music DJs that were inspired by that time of what the artists and his group were listening to. And so obviously a really great time. And uh, with Hassan Hajjaj, uh, most recently, we asked him to come over into Abu Dhabi and produce um, his own uh, photo shoot that people could sign up to. And it was really fun. You know, people came all dressed up and we had this on site at the Culture Foundation um, and where we did like a three day photography session with the artist. Um, and then people could have their photographs taken home with them as well. So this was a really great way um, for the audience to be in contact with, uh, with the artist. Um, and then finally also collaborated with Hassan Hajjaj. We brought over uh, a Ganawa group from Morocco uh, that performed on stage at the Culture Foundation uh, with their uh, traditional Ganawa Moroccan uh, performance, singing and dancing. And so this brings us to how we have been adapting to the new times. Um, we, because we do not have a building, our focus was hugely on satellite locations and uh, physical presence. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have any digital presence at all whatsoever. Um, no website, no Instagram to work from. And so this was really the only platform that we could work into. Um, upon the crisis, the Department of Culture of Tourism, uh, which is the government entity that uh, Guggenheim Abu Dhabi works within, uh, they launched a platform called Culture All, which hosted um, uh, a lot of uh, digital material that could be posted into the website and that people could access to. This ranged from uh, past events, so it was also used as an archival uh, website, as well as using it as a platform to post new events as well. So we have been using uh, abulabiculture.ae to be um, uh, marketing our new programming that have now all been uh, digital. Um, and so with our new programming this year, we had to quickly shift. Uh, we definitely had a pre, uh, a, you know, a, an idea before uh, we plan our programming ahead in advance. And so that was all cut off because it really focused on, you know, bringing artists to the country and working with, you know, high capacity events, et cetera. Um, and so we, this time around, we really wanted to acknowledge the current mood in the global shift. What did people want to see and what did people need? Um, and then also uh, having us a, a new inaugural program that was built to support local artists and initiatives. Um, we deemed that this was really important as a lot of the opportunities actually went down. Um, and so uh, financial and uh, visual support for the artists was definitely needed. And this also still allowed us an opportunity for uh, presenting, uh, uh, announcing collection, uh, announcing artworks from the collection. And so we were asking ourselves, what does the world need right now and how can we provide that through art? Uh, within uh, the new program, we wanted to focus on building human connections, um, 
quarantine gave us a, a new time and space for reflection and introspection. We wanted to bond community and bring them together uh, and then also continue to support our local and resident artists. So our first program, uh, this uh, and now we are continuing to pursue this as an annual program as well, where we uh, asked uh, a few local artists to present their work and we would come into their studio and allow them to speak about their work and also showcase their studio. Um, this was really interesting as some of the artists had been working through the pandemic uh, in a different way. We asked them to reflect about their experiences, but also some artists, you know, had their studios shut down because of the lockdown restrictions. Um, and so this was implemented into pre-recorded videos and interviews that were then put online on the Culture All platform. Uh, and then we ended in a panel discussion uh, on Zoom where we basically spoke about um, the artist community uh, and also the, I guess, resilience and the strength and power of artist communities and really focusing on that grassroots uh, concept. Um, this is the first time that Guggenheim Abu Dhabi has done this as a focus. We mostly focus on students and uh, blue chip artists, but now we are uh, heading into this uh, into this frame. And so finally, uh, for our uh, program that we have recently launched, Waiting for the Future, where we collaborated with a few, a couple of artists from the collection, Mariko Mori and YZ Kami, where we asked them to present their work through a panel discussion uh, on Zoom. And we held, we hosted these on, uh, on YouTube live. And so people could actually comment into the comment section and ask their questions to the artists directly as well. And a lot of the artwork that, and with the reason that we chose these artists was because their practices were uh, very focused on the qualities of spirituality and meditation. And so we really wanted to convey that, those notions of oneness and, uh, and togetherness. And finally, um, our upcoming program, which I invite you all to come and join us on the 24th of November. Uh, we are working with Tunisian artists Selma and Sofian, who we see who are uh, dancers and choreographers uh, and performers. Um, and so we, com we communicated with them that we wanted to uh, commission them to create a performance. And so what does this mean now that we can actually you know, visit uh, shows or actually work in the theater. And so they really had to think around that and uh, figure out a way to present uh, their new performance. And so the upcoming performance is totally being done on um, uh, through, through, through online. Um, and so that proposed a lot of new challenges. However, it also was very experimental and allowed for a new way of collaboration. They wanted to create that theater experience without being there. Um, and you can see the quote by, uh, by Selma there when we spoke with her. And, and the performance is going to be very interesting. We have uh, six women uh, performers who are working with the artists. Uh, the, it's, the, the notions of the performance bring about this idea of uh, uh, imprisonment and, and, and essentially these artists who have always been in diaspora, whether in uh, Syria and Beirut or Brussels or Sao Paulo. And they reflect on this notion that um, the, the crisis has really just brought to the forefront uh, about how many uh, people actually already live in, in restriction, restrictive movement already due to, um, due to war zones, uh, uh, trauma and et cetera. And so here we are really reflecting on that notion. And so what we realize is that um, we can still have uh, impactful art through digital avenues. Um, we are able to reach more people and artists from all over the world. Um, and really the restrictions have accelerated an art un already existing conversation about the use of technologies by museums. And so 
here we're really understanding that we do need to continue and develop and update how we use a uh, digital presence uh, in the institution. Um, and again, as well, uh, a new avenue for experimentation for artistic practices. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so we, we had uh, seven very, very uh, interesting and rich um, um, presentations. I think we have um, some time um, for a general discussion among the people um, who are presenting, and then we'll stop um, in advance a little bit of the session um, to take some of the online questions. We have a whole queue of them um, showing up in the Q&A, which I'll do my best to um, to package together and to uh, let you know about. So um, I guess the thing, one of the things that's a strong takeaway for me um, out of this panel is this idea that um, that Hillary was bringing up of the digital being both um, processes and systems, right, and people and machines. And I wondered maybe where we could start with that idea, right, of what kind of know-how, right, is actually required for the museum not to be like the, the institution that has digital in one room, right? But where digital is kind of infused across the entire, um, the entire process. What kind of know-how, what kind of, in other words, another way of putting that is what kind of human infrastructure is required for that to actually take place for this new museum? Anybody, would anybody like to start? Um, um, I can think of some obvious people. I can pretend that I'm in class and call on people, or I can just let someone um, jump in. Well, I'd, I would say someone that's currently trying to hire a team, um, that's probably a natural uh, segue for myself. So I would say that, you know, increasingly, I don't know anyone who doesn't use digital tools to do their job. Uh, so it's, it's once again, I don't, I don't understand kind of the question in a sense of like the, the, to me, digital is not separate from anything else. It's a tool just like any other tool we use to, do, use to do our jobs and no one is not using digital tools. I think what's interesting now is, you know, how everyone suddenly is on Zoom, whereas many of us have been on, you know, the predecessors to that for the last 20 years as we've worked globally um, with other collaborators. So I think the tools are just embedded in the practice at this point. Um, I think to me, the important thing is having the people that we bring on board aware that the human connections and the connections between the tools are actually more important than the tools that we're using today. Um, something I keep saying is that if we put out like an RFP for a video conferencing system, uh, even 18 months ago, would Zoom even have been on your list? Right, you would have had WebEx and you would have had, you know, these other Cisco and things on there, right? So the tools are continuously changing, but the need and the use case is what's important. And, and what is the function we're trying to fulfill with the technology? That's actually what's critical. What we do it with today is only is ephemeral comparatively. It's those connections, it's the people, it's how we relate to each other. And organizationally, I think it's how we work in a much more agile fashion and much more collaboratively and across um, the groups. And right now we're, we have the, you know, fortunate aspect of being a small team. So we actively just are collaborating constantly. It's our default mode. Um, but for me, one of the challenges as a group scales is how do you keep that kind of collaboration going? How do you make the links be the important thing and not the silos, not the boxes? Um, I, I would completely concur on, on that. And I think um, that's a significant challenge for long established institutions and in institutions of great size. Um, and I think so one of the challenges that or one of the things that I think we need and one of the things I would like to see moving forward are more multidisciplinary teams um, because we we describe our organization sort of by hierarchy and by department um, and I would like to and something we've been experimenting with on a very small scale in the digital uh, division is a, a, that sort of notion of a squad so based, based around more sort of Spotify model of a multidisciplinary team, a, a unit of people who all have different skills that they bring to the party that they're working on a specific task. Um, and I'm interested in how that might scale in some corners of the organization, but I, I, I certainly think it's a challenge. The other skill that I would add, um, so there, there are a couple there. One is being able to work in a multidisciplinary way. 
understanding what you bring to the party, but also leaving space for other people to bring their thing to the party. Um, and there's a notion there of um, a more sort of equitable balance between skill sets rather than any one area having um, greater weight. Um, but the other really, really key skill is an awareness and understanding of audience and an agreement on who the target audience are. Uh, and then a willingness to make uh, decisions based on evidence about that audience rather than the rather than the, the very, very human and reflexive thing we all do um, of assuming that you are the audience and that the that everybody is the same and everybody thinks and wants and needs the same as you. So being able to look at audience data and make some decisions based on that. And there is creativity around that. It's about being um, audience informed informed by the data, not necessarily led by it. So there, is, there are creative responses to that and there are, um, there, there's space in there to, to interpret, but, but it does have to be that kind of putting the audience at the, at the, at the very center and focusing on them and um, absorbing and internalizing the, the idea that they are not you, I think is, is a really great starting point. And, and everybody could benefit from that every day. Would anybody else like to jump in on that question about I mean, Please, I think, Anna. Yeah, I just think like exactly as, as Leith said, like museums have been staffed up until now to, to kind of research, design and create exhibitions and to, you know, to do the scholarly work that kind of, you know, to create catalogues and, and these sorts of things. That's how museums are staffed. And I think if we were to start a museum, let's say it's an educational tech company, you know, how would you staff an educational tech company, it, it would be very different to how you would staff a, an exhibition, a physical exhibition creating machine. Um, I'm, I'm being a bit provocative there. I'm not sure museums need to be educational tech companies, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's a huge change um, to, to get the staff that you need to kind of fulfill that mission. I think it's a really interesting thought experiment just to, to ask for, for a museum to ask themselves, what would we do if we were starting from scratch today? you know, just as, a, as an exercise. Um, um, but yeah, it, it is, a, it is, a, it is a, a very big and challenging thing to do. And um, at a, particularly at a time of um, lockdown and pandemic where we're looking at economic downturn and where there are mass job losses across all sectors. That is a, that is a very challenging thing to do and we have to be sensitive to that. But absolutely, you know, there are, it's not about creating um, a tech company out of a museum, but it's looking at what the, tra there are many, many transferable skills within a museum and working out how they might be deployed, usefully deployed in, in ways that move us in a direction of becoming more agile, I think. Yeah, so since I'm on my second startup museum in a row, I will just interject that one thing I do is hire almost no one from museums. So almost all of my staff come from adjacent fields. And I find that that's really important because frankly, people that come from long museum histories tend to be a bit more calcified in their way of, of approaching these topics. And if you pull someone from something that's very closely adjacent, the creativity and I, the lack of those kind of boundaries is, is much more um, apparent. And it's, it's actually, it's a lot more fun too. I hate to say sometimes when you pull in people, you know, that are maybe a vintage video game collector and you hire them as your operations director, you get very interesting things coming out of that. I, would. I think Olivier and Peter are unmuted. Would you like to contribute? Well, well yeah. I, uh, I could say that, uh, well, in the Rijksmuseum, we see uh, since the COVID uh, uh, crisis, well, you, uh, I think a little, a little bit uh, about how the transformation in newspapers uh, has been uh, done in the last five or ten years, because they also come from a from an um, analog world, I would say, and they have made the transition in the last five or ten years to um, to digital. So I think they have now an infrastructure that every article they they, they make it's digital. They can put it on a website immediately and put it on the on the paper news, uh, the, really the, the the paper newspaper. Um, they also have the stuff now is getting used to that um, uh, in the last five years. And what they also did is also interesting, is that they did uh, the paywall uh, transformation. So ten years ago, it was not um, it was not normal for uh, newspapers to ask money online. And now, yeah, you see all the newspapers have paywalls and we think it's it's normal. 
So yeah, on those three levels, infrastructure, people, and maybe also paywalls, I think there's the, we, I see the transition going and also within the Wax Museum, well, uh, are working on those three fields. So. Olivier, did you have something? Uh, yeah. Um... I, I don't really know this industry we made this game and I know the research industry also because I, I've got a PhD and there is all similar, I think it's very similar because you've got this institution, this hierarchy, long-term decision making that makes your decision in two years old and it's out of date. But what would be interesting is two things, the museum maybe in video games, it's a thing of every day. You play it every day. It's everyday life stuff. It's Netflix is not about producing content. It's about producing a kind of habitus, kind of fact that every day I'm going to go into Netflix to see whatever it is from high to middle quality to low quality, but I am used to that. And when you play games, it's quite the same. So I don't know because it may be at the opposite of what would be a museum or high class on high bro culture versus low bro culture. And who has the right to say, uh, or the authority to say this is good content? And I think this is a very important question to say, if you want to survive is, what's a good content in a digital economy where attention is first, when you fight for the time, people don't have to. And secondly, you maybe think about event or organization based on event or everyday life, this is not quite the same, and it's not the same stage of producing, we have a lot of A-B testing, for example, in the, in the industry. You do that, it doesn't work, it works like this. So you, you very choose in a very quick way. So I think it's philosophical. What's the museum for? Is it for conveying past or is it for the future and present? Secondly, I think it's about the way you produce the content because art, producing art is not curating art, I think, and producing stuff is not curating stuff. And also who you are going to address, the audience. That's all. <laughs> Thanks. Well, let me change the let me change uh, the conversation a little tiny bit. Um, one of the things that um, is sitting was sitting under all of the conversations that we had, obviously, was the COVID situation, the pandemic. But I think there's another really strong conversation that's taking place in in museums. It's taking place in educational, all kinds of cultural institutions. And that's the kind of decolonization of the curriculum, or decolonization of the of the of the museum, or whatever the the predicate right is for that. And I'm curious if um, I mean Sarah brought this up in the explicit model right of the Guggenheim being about decentering right a an artistic experience. And I'm wondering what kinds of tensions do you see between that active role of decolonizing um, the production that you and so in, including more stories, multiple versions of stories, etc. And, um, and going to where the audience is, right, because the audience is not always at that space. Uh, does anybody have anything to say about that about what's happening in their own praxis because anyway, that's my question. Would anyone like to, uh, Sarah, maybe, would you like to jump in on that? Yeah, of course, um, you know, the, uh, first of all, you know, the museum is built, uh, the collection is building from ground zero. So from absolutely nothing. And so we start to think about how do we stem from that? How do we start to build stories around that? Um, and what became apparent within our research is that um, multiple things around the world are happening all at the same time. You know, there is not one uh, primary source, uh, you know, and so how do we re represent that um, accurately and authentically, I guess, and uh, hopefully through our exhibitions in the future and um, with our research that we'll be able to present and uh, and bring up underrepresented histories in that way, for sure. Um, but I guess in through the d digital space, how I guess for us, it really is thinking about how um, uh, how can how can we build how can we reach those audiences um, and would they want to? Um, is this the type of thing that they're interested in as well? Um, so yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, I can speak 
to this a little. Um, there's a lot of practice happening and a lot of conversation happening internally at Tate generally, but just to speak to the digital departments of my area a bit specifically, um, this is something we're really sensitive to and alive to um, and are working towards, however, you know, although I'm not claiming any level of perfection. Um, but some things that we've done that I can share, if that's helpful, we have, um, we have had now for hmm, two and a half, coming up three years, uh, commissioning for diversity um, protocol. So when we, the majority of the content we commission tends to be film. Um, and we have, we have a sort of a protocol that basically requires um, every piece of film content and wherever possible, wherever sort of appropriate every piece of non-film content that we're commissioning out from external partners, um, uh, hits certain criteria for diversity in terms of who's involved. And that's both on screen and in terms of the production crew. So that's, there, there are things that fall out of that. So we've had to be very active in who we are, in, in looking for who we're inviting in to make content for Tate. And the reason for that is we want the their perspectives and we want that lens. And that's for films that are about artists. So that's also some of, you know, that's sometimes our marketing trailers. So it's across the piece. Um, but we're so we're trying to get different perspective and different lenses, as well as who is in front of who can you actually see on camera? Because we that's obviously important. We want people to be able to see people like themselves when they're engaging in content about art and artists. But we also want to have the the, the an appropriate lens that that's coming through. Um, and we also have a process in in the content team called sense checking, whereby a piece of content isn't published unless it's gone through a couple of rounds of sort of peer review, if you will, informal internal peer review to ask the awkward questions about who's left out of this bit of content, who haven't you thought about in this piece of content um, as, as, a, as an exercise in trying to um, check ourselves before we publish. Um, and we're also very live to social listening. So we're paying very close attention to what's happening in social media. And, and tracking what people are saying in our social channels, but also elsewhere in social media. And you know, what, what, what are the conversations that are bubbling up? Um, and just sort of trying to, to do a lot of self-directed learning and, and, and a pay, it's that thing, again, thinking about the audience, paying very, very, very close attention to audiences who aren't necessarily speaking to us, but who we need to listen to in order to be able to reach. Um, and again, as I said, I'm, I'm not claiming any level of perfection, but if that's, um, if that's useful to anybody, I'm sharing it. Thank you. Anyone else? One more person, perhaps, on that topic? All right, well, I have one more question, and that's about, about devices. Um, you know, we, we live in this world of, of devices that are kind of constantly changing. And I'm thinking about Olivier when I was playing your game and when I was, I was um, uh, trying out the Smartify app in preparation for this event, I was, I was really thinking about the, um, the tensions and that exist between the kind of affordances that devices provide us with, right? And then what kinds of things we can actually do with the kinds of content that we have. Um, and so, you know, I think, I, I mean, I think, you know, a, a smartphone has all kinds of things associated with it. It has um, location services, it has an accelerometer, it has, um, like, well, increasingly, we may be able to check blood oxygen levels or, you know, we now have LiDAR, right, on the new Apple phone, on the new iPhone. So I'm curious about what, how do you, how do you keep, not necessarily keep up with the devices, but how do you continue to engage with devices and, and match what a device can do with the kinds of both content and uh, to use Olivier's term, kind of pedagogical nature of what you're trying to do with that. I think I'm thinking of Olivier and Anna particularly here, but maybe Olivier, you can respond and then uh, anyone else, thanks. Yeah, that's a big question because everything is a matter of physics. I think it's a physical interaction first, meaning that I touch a screen, I touch a mouse, and use a gamepad, whatever. So you think about your body, and how you are onboarded into the technology first. Secondly, we are using devices which are not de designed for an art experience. They're designed for WhatsApp, for mailing, for watching videos, point. So um, they put you into a situation of kind of spectator, but thanks to the, this little body that click, even with one finger, you can interact. 
So you really think about how to live into a digital thing, how to interact with that. So you think first how you use it. For example, we, we made a very easy game to handle because we wanted to everybody to play it with no skills. And it's very important because in video games, you've got a lot of physical skills. And so we wanted to have more than uh, cognitive skills or intellectual skills, more than physical skills. But also physical is something very important in art. And we should think about a kind of games based on art and movement and posture. We've got a lot of devices able to do that. But also when you think about devices, you need to think about the, uh, how people are used to consume it because um, you will not play the same game in the same way if you play it on a computer with a gamepad or on your mobile. And according to where you play it, do you play it on your uh, house, outside, when we could go outside or on your work time? All of this is very important because games can be played everywhere, every time, but in different manners. And so finally, last point is um, you have out of some kind of uh, consumption culture, you are willing to pay stuff on computers as you are not willing to pay stuff on mobiles. So when you go mobile first, you go free first because it's the way it is. I think here nobody paid anything in last year, but you were used to pay CD-ROM, you were used to pay games, you were used to pay big stuff. So this is very interesting because if you go free, you've got to monetize it. So Device is also where you consume the content, and so the consume and in a capitalistic way, or you pay for it, who pay for that. So that's all the question you've got in mind. I don't know if it answers your question, David. Thanks, Olivier, thank you. Anna, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, like from my perspective, you know, thinking about museums, um, you know, museums, my, my advice and what we try to do with Smartify is, you know, have like kind of technology that is very loosely connected and very light so that you can be flexible with, you know, how you're connecting things. So an example might be, you know, eShop, you know, we've integrated eShop and we work with hundreds of museums. Some of them are on Shopify or services. that are a lot more easy to integrate into lots of different platforms and put that into Instagram and put that into Smartify or wherever they want to. And others are trapped in these kind of old, models where they have a lot less flexibility and so therefore they can't just quickly put things in in different um platforms or for example um the yale center for british art um wanted to kind of put their whole collection on wikimedia and um they're you know struggling to do that themselves but through but smartify is kind of a very light platform and we can actually feed it directly into the glam framework that's on wikimedia so that way we're kind of helping them to kind of do that but i think just thinking about um you know having small pieces of technology that are that are flexibly connected is is important for kind of the growth as we change you know we have these changing tools and i'm really excited to see what we can do with the lidar mapping for just personally in terms of mapping of, of collections as well i think it's a really exciting development thanks anna i think what we'll do now is just to, is to change a little bit the direction is take some questions that have come in um, through the live q a um, I have a question for Peter, um, and this is, uh, I'm going to just read the question literally. Um, Given the gravitas of the work of a museum, this method of outreach provides a wonderful, exciting contrast to traditional museum marketing. But I wonder, did you find that certain sectors of your audience felt alienated by the forward, hip, and contemporary tone and story orientation? Um... No, I, I don't think so, <laughs> because yeah, if you look at Rag Studio, um, then we have like that Pinterest style concept, and well, it's it's for everyone. Curators can use it, um, uh, but also big audience can use it. And curators they understand, um, yeah, that 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 you have to to reach a big audience, that you have to have a different tone. And well, and basically what we always say, if you, we say, well, the, the, the collection belongs not to the Rijks Museum, but belongs to all the Dutch people, the taxpayers, and to the whole world. And if you uh, say that and you give it all away digitally in high res, ultra high res, then um, it doesn't belong to us anymore. So we cannot say you, you are not allowed to do that. So yeah. There are always people um, that that are a little bit, uh, yeah. How do you say it? Uh, 
not so fond of some things, but in general, we, we had no complaints, only enthusiastic uh, reactions. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question that's uh, specifically for Hillary, but I think that it could um, actually be uh, asked, answered by several people. And that question is, Hillary, in what way has the content that people seek online changed over the course of the pandemic? Um, uh, so when we first locked down, so speaking, I, I can speak to the, our experience in the UK and uh, I haven't tested this globally, but I wonder, and I suspect it might be fairly similar. Um, when we locked down in March, the very first thing we saw was a huge pivot from, um, and it's obvious, people who were looking to book exhibitions and um, turn up, visit our visit pages, went straight to the collection instead. Um, but the other big surge we saw was people hungry for live, something that felt live, and, so, and, and there was a, a great, very great desire for anything that's new, what's live and of the moment. Um, and I think that was also spoke to the just the kind of the psychological impact of a nation locking down and moving to digital tools, but that for many of them was, was very new. So there's kind of a novelty aspect for that. And then as, um, as we moved through lockdown and the schools closed, a huge surge towards all our learning content. All, none of this is rocket science, it's really obvious. Um, but that's that movement to um, learning content was um, parents and teachers wanting to facilitate online learning for children as much as it was kids online. And we have, um, it, it's been a nice thing to watch. It's one of, the, one of the little joys in our team throughout lockdown. We have a, a gallery, a Tape Kids gallery. We've got a tape paint game. We can make a artwork online and you upload it to the gallery. And seeing the where kids are coming from the world, from across the world. You can see where children are logging on. As the schools close, as schools closed across the world, we saw those children coming online and putting their paintings um, on the website, which was a really nice thing, a nice place to be convening around. Um, but quite soon after, locked, once lockdown sort of settled in, so really quite soon, a couple of weeks in, that appetite for live and the liveness and wanting everything to be live and immediate really fell away. And we have seen that continue to tail off. Um, and now um, audiences, I say, are much more discerning. At the start of lockdown, you could, there was a lot, there was a grace period where you could try and experiment much more and you could fail in public and be forgiven much more early on. And I think there's an expectation now that we have professionalized over the last six months and that things have become, there's an expectation of greater polish and, and, and less desire for things to be live now and a, and a greater need to, for people, people want to schedule their lives and they want to be able to do things on demand when they're ready to do them. Um, I think screen, screen fatigue is real. Is, 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 we're seeing that very much. And so people are wanting things in packages when they're ready to do it. Um, and also a quest, an interesting one is around when people are online because it's different through the day now. People are not, you know, live stuff in the evening, don't even bother. They're not, they've, they've logged off by then because they've spent all day looking at staring into a screen, particularly if they're doing desk-based work. So that it's, it's been, it, live has been the thread that's really been, that has really varied throughout lockdown and everything else has been quite an obvious surge. If you look at what's happening in the real world, you can sort of see that mirrored online. Anyone else like to respond to that? Okay, we'll move with the next question. Um, if the, it, I'm gonna read it. If the museum offer is going to be increasingly integrated across physical, spatial and digital, digital assets and programs, how do you ensure access is expanded when the digital divide is continuing and possibly a growing problem around the world? There's no one specifically addre that addressed this question. Would anyone like to answer it? I can have a go. Um, I think that's... Um, I think that's and then okay, great. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. I don't have an enormous amount to say I, other than I agree this is a very important question we need to pay close attention to. Um, and one note I would say is we need to ensure that we are making experiences that can be that can be used across as many different forms and formats as possible to increase the opportunities to access in so far in, in as much as we can. Um, as a museum, we cannot bridge the digital divide for 
communities we cannot we're, we're not in the business of sending out equipment of sending out laptops and phones but i do think we have a duty to make sure that what we create is accessible on those design devices that are being sent out which means lower end devices and not always making experiences that hit the, the most recent phone that, that hit the most recent laptop um, or would require the greatest processing power sometimes the things that um, people need are that can be delivered very very simply or be delivered in a range of ways so that someone with the least access can access the essence of what it is you're putting online. So for example, um, if you're streaming a talk, putting up a, a transcript of that talk in a, in a file that someone can download easily over, a, you know, over um, 3G, for example, is, is an op it gives, it gives an option and offers opportunity to access across a digital divide. And just a final note before I, before I mute again is thinking about um, accessibility as well. So designing all experiences to be as accessible as possible to people with a range of needs, whether that's using screen readers um, or people who are who are not able to navigate using a mouse and things like that. So it's just you know following best practice for digital accessibility as well as access. Thanks, Olivier. Uh, yeah, um, uh, before going into the museum field, I was uh, I, I was running a startup in the driving industry. We, making a game to learn how to drive. And we have this issue about how to reach people. And we, we, we are based on local network, institution, association. And it was a way to, because it was not a matter of digital divide. It was a matter of social divide, geographical divide, class divide, the real structuration of society. And I think the digital divide is very important and it's an opportunity to go outside and for example with the game for seven we had a huge audience in uh, america latina so it's very cool because it's less expensive to buy a low-end low computer than taking a plane ticket going to paris spend a lot of money just to visit pompidou so i think there is this kind of adequacy saying okay we go the, the broader way we make the, the the game playable on the many earlier sense many devices but it was an opportunity to pass the social barrier because i think all the public policies for example in france in matter of cultural promotion they just reinforce high class consumption they were not openly to the lower class so thanks to digital stuff we can hope to up to that i think it's better than nothing just to up to region Thanks. And I, I apologize to all the, the great questions that are coming in on the Q&A. Um, we just don't have time for, to, to ask all of them today. I'm going to end with um, one last one. And this is really for anyone. Um, is, and it's, I'm going to read it. Do you think experiencing art in person will remain as significant 10 years from now as it is today? Distributing digital content is more efficient. However, how do you maintain the importance of a real life visit and encourage younger generations to experience museums? Maybe, um, I don't know if any, if, uh, maybe, uh, Anna, I see you've unmuted. I think it's only going to increase the importance of a physical visit. Um, it, it's kind of what Hillary said, you know, people at the end of the day, they don't want to be on their computer because they've been on that all day. So I think there will be online and, and that will be the kind of day to day. But those kind of special family visits, social visits to museums where you kind of go and you have this amazing physical experience and in, in, often in an incredible architectural space will be, you know, far more important, if anything. Basically, what Anna said. I suppose I'd only add that this um, to to reflect that there are you know the music industry didn't people don't not go to gigs now because you can download all the music you can people don't buy but don't not buy books because you can download books um, people still go to the cinema people still when they can people still went to the theatre when they could. Um, I think the live experience is, is, a, is a very, very important person, a very important part of the human condition, that sort of group social experience. I do think what this might require of museums and any other physical thing is to adapt and make that their offering even more distinctive. So when you think about cinemas, for example, um, when they're challenged by the likes of Netflix, 
um, they have had to add to their offer. So you now have membership schemes or you have experiences like secret cinema. Um, so, so, that they're, so in terms of enhance and what, what might enhance that real life experience. But as Anna said, I, don't, I think it's gonna only become more important. And we also know that people are more likely to go to something um, in real life that if they've had experienced it online online actually increases the the access and the awareness so that when you are in a in a position where you can go in real life you do well i think that's a great place to end our panel today um uh, i think it's been a very very interesting discussion um thank you all for your presentations um, for these very, very interesting and in, insightful uh, forward thinking um, looks at, at new practices in museums and um, in the art world. So I really appreciate uh, your time today. Um, and thank you so much to all those um, behind the scenes, um, to the event organizers and to the translators who made this um, possible um, for the world to see. So um, uh, again, great session. Thank you very much.